Hey, um, you know, everything that has gone before has been fun and phenomenal. I hope that you have learned something. That's why we do what we do. But this is the real fun part. This is where you get to bring your questions to us. And you, they don't have to be limited to the talks that we've given. Um, you, may have, you may have been sitting there thinking, that was really great. I learned a lot, but that's not what I have questions about. Well, you can bring those questions too. Um, it's simple. Um, those of you who have been to this before, because we do it regularly, you uh, normally you raise your hand and ask a question. What we're going to ask you to do this time is actually come up to the microphone. Um, now, now listen, I, I know that we usually have a far more just kind of casual, laid back kind of setting, but we do have an online audience right now, and so it'd be nice if they can hear you. And for recording purposes, so to be able to hear what is being asked um, as well. And so we're, we just kind of ask that. You come up, ask your question so we can get on the audio and people can hear it. And then we will, um, as I say, you make up the questions, we will make up the answers. And so, um, but yeah, and if you have a specific question for a specific person, you just direct it to them and the rest of us will correct them if they get it wrong. And that's kind of that's how that goes. Um, and, and we, as much fun as it is to talk over each other, we only have one microphone between the four of us. So we're going to have to share and, you know. <laughs> No, I, I'm pretty sure everyone up here could be heard quite well without a microphone, but um, no, no, not, not, not one of my skills. no, okay. And anyone online, if you have a question, um, we will be, we are able to take questions from online. Uh, but those who are here in person, uh, you get priority. So, yeah, so this is the fun part. Ooh, tumbleweeds. I know, right? Wow, we've done a good job. They don't have any questions. There we go. Uh-oh, Brave Soul coming up. I don't know. When you're witnessing to Mormons, specifically, what um, avenue, what way of explaining the gospel have you found best with them? So the thing about talking to our Mormon friends is you it's the, the main thing is you have to teach grace and here's why um one of my best friends former mormon and um the way she has said it is you can easily lead a mormon out of mormonism but you will lead them into atheism um in fact the statistic is is really alarming 80 to 90 depending on the statistic you read 80 to 90 percent of mormons who leave the mormon church turn to atheism um, and you can see why they feel like they've been duped, they feel like they've been led astray, and that religion inherently must be corrupt because they're, they've been lied to their whole lives and they're angry. Um, so the best way that I have found in, in reaching our Mormon neighbors to, with the gospel effectively is to remind them of grace. And so whenever we were talking to, to our LDS friends or they come to your door, it's reminding them of grace because they don't have a concept of grace outside of working for it, uh, which is not grace. Um, and so uh, the thing that I always point them to is that I don't have to worry about how good my effort was or about how good uh, my deeds were or did I do enough good deeds. I remind them that my security, my eternal security rests totally on Jesus. Um, and when, when we remind them that we talk about grace, we say things like, because we use the same terminology, right? Like they would use grace. We use grace. But the two graces mean very different things. Our grace men, means that even in our worst, so we go to Romans 5, 8, right? Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For them, that would not be, that would not make sense. They would say, well, yeah, he died for us, but that only covers after we do everything else. And so again, it's, it's really just that reminder that there is grace, 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 and it's not about works, works, works. Um, they, they just don't have a concept an understanding of grace outside of working for it. Um, and that's what's so heartbreaking about it is, is they get, they get close in some ways and they share terminology with us, but until they hear the gospel of grace presented over and over again, that's, it's, it's, they're just not going to hear it. And the second thing is, um, whether you whether you like the King James version Bible or not, it really is helpful to use that text because they would say, 
That's the only version of the Bible that is accurate, or at least as accurate as they claim it can be. So if you're quoting something from NIV or NASB, ESV, whatever, they're going to go, oh, yeah, but that's super corrupted. So therefore, you're not understanding it correctly. So I, again, using the same scripture you would use in any other situation, but using it from the KJV actually is more helpful than you would think. But it's that, it's that reminder of grace and pointing them to Jesus throughout the scripture where he talks about his grace. That's really the key is, and, and again, just be encouraged. And this is not going to sound encouraging, but I mean for it to be. On average, and this is just a national average, on average, from first exposure to the gospel, to if they come to know Jesus Christ, it's about eight and a half to nine year span. Because it's relational. Um, when you even talking about grace, there, here's the thing: the Mormon Church is actually full of members who are not practicing Mormons. They call themselves Jack Mormons, um, and and what they mean is, I don't believe this stuff, but because it's so tied into my family, my social life, my job status. I'm going to stay in it. So they don't believe Mormonism, but they're not going to leave Mormonism. And so, in fact, the Mormon church in Utah is full of Christians who believe the Bible, believe Jesus Christ, but they're, ter they're terrified of the implication of what it means if I leave the Mormon church. To be disassociated from my family, to be um, excommunicated from my community, to lose my job, to lose my home. I mean, those are things that are realities, not really in Texas, but in Utah, certainly. So... It's a long answer, but the, the short answer is you just have to keep reminding them of grace and keep teaching them grace, 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 and, and that your works don't do anything. Your works couldn't do anything. Your works quite got you into this mess. Um, and you can go into the doctrinal route, but really all they need to hear is grace. And then once they get that kind of figured out, you can kind of argue and go through the doctrinal differences and, and so on and so forth. But And reminding them that Scripture, we believe, obviously, that the Bible is it. It's, it's a closed canon, and it's and it's the ultimate authority and final authority. They don't believe that. And so it's just having that conversation. But the best thing you can do is when your Mormon friends come to your door, answer the door and invite them in. That's the best thing. So. Just a simple addition to that because my wife does world religion stuff, and this is also her forte, and she would kill me if I didn't say it. Uh, but their actual preferred term now is Latter-day Saints. Latter-day Saints, correct. Yep. Um, and so they've also been told that if someone calls them Mormon, not to make it a big deal. Right. Uh, so it, it's probably not going to offend them. But I think just to use the terminology that prefer shows that relational aspect. But also then I think over time, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, as new generations come up and they're only referred to within the church as Latter-day Saints, Mormon's going to sound weird to them and probably be offensive. Um, even if they're consciously told not to be offended, it's going to be foreign because mm -hmm. they're not going to hear it a lot. Well, and just sorry, one more thing too. On that note, the president of the Mormon Church, um, Thomas Nelson, recently, earlier this year actually, came out and said that he doesn't even want Mormons or LDS people to call themselves that. They have four acceptable things they can call themselves. They can call themselves members of the church, members of the restored church, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so the full, or call themselves Latter-day Saints. Those are the only four acceptable terms that they're allowed to call themselves. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that we, just like Jay said, we want to make sure that we treat them fairly and call them by what they would be preferred to be called. Otherwise, it's, again, they're not going to be mad, because eh? they're not, how are we, we're not supposed to know that because we didn't go to general conference. Um, well, I did, but um, I didn't get to go in. But anyways, it was great. It's still called Mormon. I mean, you can call it that, yeah. How, um, would that be a go back to grace? Just like that and yeah. yeah, and the good news is, is the Bible is very clear that, that it does not return void. You know, we're reminded through that that it accomplishes exactly what it means to accomplish, exactly when it means to accomplish it. Um, and so if a, if a person grew up in the church and heard the word, we can rest knowing that that has not departed from them. They, they've still got that. And so our prayer is obviously that they would recognize that truth and come back to it. That's, that's obviously our prayer for that. But 
again, the best thing we can do, the, here's the thing, and you, you could ask a thousand missionaries and get the same answer. What, what discourages you the most? It's getting doors slammed in your face, getting called cult, getting called crazy, getting, you know, all this kind of stuff. That, that's unhelpful. Um, and you have to understand, too, that when we're talking to people, particularly uh, in the LDS church, most of them, just like us, have grown up in it. And so it's all they know. And so when you're questioning their worldview, you're str- and, and, if, and they start to doubt that worldview, you're literally stripping away everything they've ever known. And it's heartbreaking, and it can be very traumatic for them. And so, again, approaching this with love and grace is the only way that you're ever going to make it happen. And invite them in and continue the conversation. That's what I would say. Hopefully that helps a little bit. For those wondering about the little exercise I had there, for some reason the live stream um, died and I had to replace devices we were live streaming on. So we're back. So here we are. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. And apparently we are so good at our jobs. They have no questions. Uh oh, here we go. I'm I'm always gonna be one question. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so Eric, I didn't spend much time talking to you between between. Um, I do have a question. When you're dealing with somebody that's an atheist or this non-believer, how do you, without, because getting into a debate can often push them away. How do you do that without pushing away and get them to draw in closer? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Um, So uh, making a conversation, uh, especially in uh, by asking specific questions. Um, Greg Coco has a good book called Tactics. It's a really good book I'd recommend. But one thing I like to do is ask why it is, if ask of anyone of any religion or lack of, whether it's a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or an atheist, I say, so do you believe X? Like, so if they're, let's say an atheist, they might define it differently. So I start with, do you believe God does not exist? If they say yes, I say why? I listen to what they have to say. Um, so the goal is to have a good conversation, not necessarily engage in a debate to where there's altercation. So, for example, um, I, I, there was a young girl one time <clears throat> I was talking to, and I said, do you believe God does not exist? She said, yes. I said, what evidence do you have for that? Because in philosophy, there's something called the burden of proof. If you make a claim that something's true, you bear the burden to prove it. So that's why I started with the question, do you believe God does not exist? Yes. Okay. What evidence do you have? And her response was, well, there is no evidence for the existence of God. And I said, well... I disagree, but let's pretend that's the case. That wouldn't prove there is no God. So I ask again, what is your positive evidence for, the, for your belief that there is no God? Because, for example, I have no evidence that there's a flea in this room. I have no evidence for it. Can I conclude that, therefore, there is no flea? No, because there could be a flea. I just don't have evidence. So my lack of evidence of a flea being in this room doesn't entail that, therefore, I can conclude there is no flea. So I said, so again, what is your evidence that there is no God? She said, well, I believe in things like science, and, uh, and uh, I believe in, in history, and, and this. I said, now you're just naming disciplines. I, one more time, what evidence do you have there is no God? So at this point, I'm not arguing. I'm just, I want to hear what you have to say. And then I had one person say, well, you can't prove there is no God. I said, okay, so you have no evidence that there is no God? No. But at the beginning of the conversation, you told me you only believe things because there's evidence for it. So what am I missing? So again, we're, we're having a conversation. Um, don't be so quick to jump in and try to give a response to something, especially if they're not giving an argument against what you believe. Someone once said to me, well, I don't believe in fairy tales. I said, cool, me neither. So what do you want to talk about next? You know, it's, it's, there, there's nothing to respond to there. Someone said, I don't believe in God. Well, how about you explain to me what God you don't believe in? Because chances are, I don't believe in that God that you don't believe in either. So let's get on the same page here. You know, um, I don't believe in talking snakes. Me neither. Yeah, but there's one in the Bible. Okay, oh, so you're talking about, so, uh, well, let me ask you this. If God did exist, is it at least possible that a snake could have been used and maybe vocalized something, if that were the case? Assuming it is even a snake in the first place. If God exists, are those things at least possible? Yes. Okay, so it seems the issue here is not necessarily whether or not a snake can talk naturally, but whether or not God exists. So let's focus on that first. 
So it's a matter of getting on the same page to where you can have a fruitful discussion as opposed to talking past each other. To where, you know, again, I'm saying, you know, well, I believe God because of something like, or here's, here's some evidence we know how, we know why it's reasonable to believe God exists. We give the Kalam like Mark gave, and they say, yeah, but look what God did in the Old Testament. Well, well let's set that aside for a second. Let's, let's finish this one first. So having a conversation, asking questions, getting on the same page, not trying to respond and answer something that's not even an objection, like I don't believe in fairy tales. Well, that's just not an objection. You, you're just giving me a, you're just telling me your preference. Cool, me neither. You know, let's get on the same page, have a fruitful dialogue, ask the right questions, and be genuine. You know, genuinely listen to what they have to say. Um, I'll, I'll end with this. In talking about the soul, I was talking to one atheist, and he said, well, there's just no evidence for the soul. And I said, really? He got, I said, yeah. I said, well, have you looked any up? He goes, yeah, no, I've, I've looked. There's just no good arguments. I said, oh. So I opened up my tablet, and I said, um, can you name me the, the top three arguments that people give for the soul? And he said, well, I don't remember them. It's been long. I said, okay, it's fine. Understandable. I, I get it. Um, uh, well, how about this? Uh, give me the, the top two or three books that you read on it. I haven't read any books in it. Oh, huh. So where did you get this idea that there is no soul, there's no evidence? Well, I haven't heard any. Well, that's a different claim than what you said in the first place. In other words, let's get on the same page. You, you listen to what they say. Respond with respect and gentleness, as the Bible says. But, you know, don't, don't let little things slide like, oh, well, there's just none of this. Okay, well, tell me, what have you heard? That way we can, I can know where you're at, you can see where I'm at, and we can, you know, try to have a good, fruitful dialogue. Nothing to add? All right. Good stuff. Oh, bring it. I'll, I'll just fill in the questions if nobody else is. <laughs> uh, Jay, when, when we were talking over here, um, one thing that, one thing that uh, we were talking about is posturing. Can you elaborate on how posturing can affect our words and our projection as far as in conversations and how we come across and people perceive us. Yeah, so posture is a form of nonverbal communication. And so if, if we think of tone of voice, you say something uh, in your tone of voice that affects the way it's perceived, right? Uh, you, can, you can come across angry or happy based on your tone of voice using the exact same words. Posture is the same way. So if you say something with a posture that shows interest. You're leaning forward, you're looking at them, you're engaged, right? That is different than looking back and looking around and just kind of maybe slumped and not paying attention to someone. So our posture is another one of those forms that can affect what we're saying, both the way we're communicating and how people perceive it, but also how they perceive us. So are we listening to them? Are we paying attention? Do we think they care? And so it goes back and forth and often it's something people will pick up unconsciously but they can't consciously explain it so um, we meet in the line at the grocery store and we're just making small chat and you go back out to the car and uh, you get home and you talk to your spouse and say, hey, I met this person at the grocery store and they were a real jerk and say like, oh well why they were the jerk you might not be able to verbalize and say well because they're body posture showed this or that or whatever, but usually what that's going to be is, oh, well, that's just the sense they gave me. They seemed like they were really condescending towards me or um, they didn't listen to anything I said. They're not going to specifically usually be able to articulate that it was your body posture or your tone of voice or the way you ask questions that affected that. Um, or if, likewise, if, if they're like, oh, yeah, I met this really nice person, oftentimes they're just going to, it's going to be in generalities. And so posture is another thing that's really important that we pay attention to uh, in general. And actually even uh, on the other side, there's research to show that our posture can actually affect our own mood. And so if you feel down, if you're not having a good day, put on a suit, some nice clothes, get out of your house or whatever and go out somewhere and do business and put on a smile and essentially fake it till you make it because it, it may not cure, cure you. So um, Dylan's here with a little bit of a cold uh, and he took some medicine and that helped, but by simply getting out uh, of his home and putting on his nice jacket here, that probably helped him to some extent um, to feel better. Um, and again, it's not necessarily going to cure him of his cold. It may not last all day, but it's going to be a small step in that direction. Uh, so it's both effects 
ourselves, it affects how we communicate and it affects how others perceive us. Um, I will say one thing, you know, as far as that, that last point you made about posture affecting yourself, um, I mean, it does affect others. Um, if anyone has ever done any telemarketing, you know, they, they tell you a smile while you're talking, you know, even though you're on the phone, they make you come in dressed up in a, you know, nice, you know, clothes and everything. Um, because you feel better, you, so you sound better and, you know, you perceive things better. It, it goes the same in church. Um, I, I remember uh, having a discussion with youth group one time about um, uh, posture and, and things in church. I mean, I, I love being relaxed, okay? I, I think um, at least two of us up here have been to uh, CIA, right, cross Exam Instructor Academy, and one of the things that they tell you is to look good. Uh, they would say, don't wear jeans, wear slacks, and tuck your shirt in. And when you're talking, don't put your hand in your pocket. I do all three of those because I'm comfortable and I'm relaxed. Um, but there is something to the idea that, you know, while you're in church, um, standing up while you worship rather than just kind of sitting and singing. Um, you know, and I know that we're not, you know, Baptocostal or nothing here, but, you know, raising your hands and stuff. Whenever people are doing that, there's a gesture of just kind of the mood and the attitude. The, 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 um, when you're praying, Right, well, what, what is your posture as you pray? Well, God, let's talk. Um, I've got, you know, I mean, is your posture, right? It's going to affect your attitude as you approach God. You know, why do we fold our hands? Why do we kneel? Why do we bow our heads? Because culturally, at least for us, those are signs of respect and submission. And so we're coming to God, and that posture is informing us of our intent and our attitude. And it, it affects the, the, our thinking and our attitude as we do those things. And so... I said I just wanted to hold it, but no. Um, <clears throat> uh, no he brought up a, an interesting point, and and um, and if there's someone that has a question, come up to Mike so I can know when to shut up. Um, putting your uh, incorporating your body into worship is very very important. So, uh, you know, in my talk, uh, uh, one of my arguments was showing that you're not just a brain and body; you're more than that. You're a soul, but obviously we work within a brain and body. So I say that to say this: when the Bible talks, when Paul says he beats his flesh into submission. And that, especially you read in Romans 7, he says, a good I want to do, I don't do, because what I do, what I don't want to do, I end up doing, and what I don't want to do, that's what I do want to do, I don't do, what I don't want to do, I end up doing. He said, but I found that there's nothing good within me that is my flesh, but my inner man wants to do this. So what he's basically, he's essentially saying, you can see that from the perspective of what we're talking about earlier, substance dualism, where you also know Christ said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um... If you want to learn how to get more in tune with God and, and beat your flesh into submission, what you have to do is learn how to do things that you don't feel like or want to do. So, <clears throat> here, one of the beautiful examples, and I tell my daughter, uh, you know, hey, I use you today as an example, and she always rolls her eyes. Uh, but, you know, she knows. I don't blame her. Especially when she was younger, I'd say something like, hey, Addie, clean your room. And she says, well, I don't feel like it. And I get to her level and I say, that's fine. I said, that's perfectly fine. That's, don't worry about it. You don't have to feel like it. I'm not asking you to feel like it. I'm just asking you to do it. And that, and I, I could care less if you feel like it. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Just do it. And the point there is, yeah, there's times where we don't feel like doing stuff, but the Bible doesn't say, here are the Ten Commandments. As long as you feel like it, if not, you're good. When you do what you don't want to do and your flesh doesn't want to do, but your spirit knows you should, that's part of discipleship. That's how you get Sermon on the Mount. Christ says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, this is an Eric standardized version or perversion, whatever you want to call it, um, where Christ says, okay, so who here you have, so you haven't murdered, pat yourself on the back. Anybody here commit adultery? No, pat yourself on the back. But have you thought about it? So he's changing the perspective here of saying, I don't just want behavior modification. I want a heart transformation. In other words, I don't just want you to be the kind of person that refrains from committing adultery or murder. I want you to become the kind of person that does not even think about these kind of things. How do you get to that level of, of, of discipline and, and spirit, uh, spiritual formation? By 
controlling, in order to be able to change what you can't, you have to control what you can. So, I, whenever I teach on spiritual formation, I like to give two prescriptions that anyone can do today. If you're at Walmart, and you're at about, or, or H-E-B, whatever, wherever you shop, <clears throat> um, and you're about to check out, and let's say you look in your basket and you say, you know what, I could do without this. When you get this, the, whatever that item is, don't do this. Don't go like this. <clears throat> and then you kind of put it underneath, in like, you know, the gum section so nobody sees it. I, I would encourage you to step out of the line, as long as it is, go back to where you got it from and place it exactly where you got it from. Why? Because while you may not, let's say you have an addiction to pornography or an addiction to something else that you cannot control because your will has become so weak, you're, you're almost uh, trapped in some type of addiction, would well, control the things you can. You can get out of a line and go replace something back that you're not going to buy. But what you're doing is you're teaching your flesh, you're not going to control me, and I'm not going to give in to what you want. You're going to have to do what I want, and I want to do what's right, and I'm going to put this back over here. <clears throat> And then when you're about to, when, after you load your groceries in your car, don't take the grocery back basket and then put it behind my car so I can hit it. Put it where the grocery basket belongs. Now, am I saying you're sinning if you don't? No, what I'm saying is when you do these things, you are once again submitting and beating your flesh into submission and making your body do something that it would prefer not to do. When you do that, you actually exercise your soul's ability to will over the body. That's literally in part why the Bible recommends fasting. When you get angry, that emotion stems from like a belly kind of an area. So when you fast, you are telling your body, guess what? You don't tell me when to eat. I tell you when to eat because you're not in control here. I am. So when you fast, you can use that as a spiritual discipline because given that you're more than a brain and body, you still have to work with the confines of the chemical composition of the things your brain and body tells you. Like, hey, I'm hungry. And you're like, that's fine, but man should not eat by bread alone. And of course, people might think you're weird if you're talking to yourself. But the point is, you're telling your body you don't run things, I do. And then hence, you beat your flesh into submission. So that way you can eventually do the things that you want to do that currently you cannot do. Anybody else? Just no. Okay. Keep it coming. Okay. Hey, Dylan. Um, we were talking a little. Uh, you mentioned earlier about Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on Darwin's theory and whether it's being taught correctly or kind of some outlying factors that people may not really realize? Yeah. I mean, the. It's become the backbone of, of a lot of atheists in the scientific community to say that they are Darwinian evolutionists. So what, what, they, what they mean when they say that is they believe that evolution, macroevolution specifically, is the mechanism by which not only humanity, but all of living organisms have come from and, and all that. And so what they're saying is that there's a common ancestor, they, they do all this. And so they, they, they say, logically, we can say that looking at um, the Bible, it clearly can't be true when it says that God spoke things into existence. That's, that's pretty far-fetched. Now we believe in this, this thing um, that is the mechanism by which all life came. Now, what they don't tell you is some of the things that Darwin actually concluded uh, and said. Um, Darwin even concluded in, in, his own, in his own words, in his own writing, he concluded that, number one, I'm, I'm using this as a theory because it's a placeholder until something better comes along. I'm not concluding that I'm right. I'm concluding that this is the best evidence that I have so far, and I may be wrong. He also then came out and said, I actually have figured out that a lot of the stuff that I've said doesn't add up. Now, that's not being taught in textbooks. It's not being taught in our school systems. It's not being taught anywhere. And so what's happening is we're getting a revisionist history version of of Darwinian evolution or Darwinian biology. Um, and, and what's sad about that is that generations of people are hearing that narrative. They're hearing um, only the side of Darwinian evolution that the atheist or that the scientific community wants to embrace because that to them seems like the most logical course. One of the things about Darwinian evolution that I find the most puzzling is the idea of where everything came from to begin with. And so the idea is that they rest on is an idea called spontaneous generation. 
Now, obviously, that is what they what it sounds like. It's they're they're saying that somehow in the primordial soup, everything was just right. The conditions were perfect for uh, enough nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, so on and so forth. Enough of enough of all the essential elements in the atmosphere and on the earth that somehow life spontaneously generated itself from non-life, which itself goes against scientific principles. Um, in, in physics, there's a thing called thermodynamics in which the first law states something cannot come from nothing. Right? So when we look at science, science itself disavows the idea of spontaneous generation, and yet many evolutionary biologists say, well, that's what had to have happened. And in order to, uh, to kind of see if the probability of that would... Um, could, could actually have occurred. Um, there was a scientist, and, and his name escapes me, but a brilliant scientist back in the, he won a Nobel Prize, and I, I, his name has escaped me for some reason. I'm so sorry. But he wanted to do the calculation of the probability that life could erupt from non-life or, or e evolve from non-life or just happen. And so he did this calculation, and it took him over a year to do the calculation. I mean, it's a massive number. And he concluded that the chance that non-life could produce life on its own without any other factors, even if everything was perfect. And he, and by the way, the life that he's talking about was not even a fully functioning cell. It was the simplest possible cellular life form that we can imagine. It was one chance in 10 to the 30,000th power. Now, that's a large number, but to give you an idea of how large that number actually is, the atom, which is one of the smallest components of, of life that we know, it's a building block of life, in the entire observable universe, like that's everything in the cosmos that we know or have proof exists. So all of it, everything on earth, everything in outer space, all of it, thousands and millions and billions of light years. Scientists estimate that there's only around 10 to the 82nd number of atoms in the entire observable universe. And yet the probability of life coming from non-life is 1 in 10 to the 30,000th power. It's a staggering number. It's a staggering number, which doesn't make any sense. And yet, this is not being taught. This is not being, uh, our people are not being educated on the lunacy of some of these, these theories. And so, really, what Darwin taught is not what's being taught as Darwinian evolution anymore. Um, it's, it's a revisionist history of Darwinian evolution that's being taught, and that's what's being propagated in our school systems and in our colleges and everywhere else. So. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I thought of, because uh, you and I both touched on uh, the idea of morality, and whenever people are saying, oh, well, we got morality because of we evolved that way. Right? And, and you'll hear people argue, I, I mean, PhD, scholar, atheists, you know, arguing that we have morality because we evolved empathy. Well, but the question, you know, it's like because we, we empathize, oh, well, I know this hurts you, so I don't want to do it, um, and, and that we develop morality through empathy. Well, here's the thing. One, I don't think empathy gets us to morality, but that's a whole other conversation. How do they know we evolved empathy? They don't. Uh, there's a book. I haven't had a chance to read the book. It's called Darwin Devolves by uh, Behe is the author. Um, but there's a part, there's a chapter in there, and I heard him in an interview talking about this chapter, where uh, the claim of evolution, you'll hear it everywhere, that we evolved something, uh, but that's really just a placeholder put in uh, that we have something. But the word evolution actually adds no new information, there's no new evidence, no new anything. So um, it, it's true that humans have empathy, but because evolution is just so ingrained in the way that they think about things, they say, oh, well, we must have evolved it. No evidence. There is no experiment, there is no study, there is no anything that shows where or how or by what mechanism this idea of empathy came about in humankind. But they'll say, we evolved it. They don't know we evolved it. But they assume evolution, so they say that's the case. And you'll find this over and over and over again in things where they say, oh, well, this evolved that way. How did it evolve that way? Well, they don't know. There's actually no evidence of you know, it evolving that way, and you'll, and you'll find all kinds of examples of this. Um, but it's so pervasive in our culture that ev and just assumed that evolution happened that you'll just find this language everywhere. No one's questioning it. And, and so, yeah. Real quick. 
Sorry. Um, the guy's name that I was talking about is Frederick Hoyle. So you can look it up. Sir Frederick Hoyle is the guy that came up with that. And I had to look at my notes to figure it out. But just give you an idea of that number one more time. He said the odds of winning a state lottery are about one chance in 10 million. So if you play the Texas lottery, no judgment here. Um, if you play the Texas lottery, you have one chance in 10 million of winning the, t the state lottery of Texas. However, the number gets a little crazier. Um, the odds of winning the state lottery every single week from 18 to 99 is one chance in 4.6 to 10 to the 10, or to 10, one chance in 10 to the 29,000th power. So it's still more probability that you could win the Texas State Lottery every week from the ages of 18 to 99 years old than spontaneous life coming from non-life. It doesn't, it just doesn't hold any water. See, I'm waiting for the group back there because I know they tend to have good questions, but they're not asking anything. Are you checking the Facebook and IG? Yeah, no. Instagram, that's what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, you're asking about just the ways that new age uh, has kind of been infiltrating the culture and, and also the church. Yes. Um, what are ways to fight against the new age, um, seeping into the church, making its inroads into the church? Um, pretty much the way to fight against any ideology making its way into the church is to be grounded in the truth. Um, that, that whenever someone comes up and says something that just, you know, is not biblical, that alarm bells are going to go off for you and go, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Even if you, this is one of the things why uh, the, the, way, the way that I teach, the way that I preach on Sunday mornings, the kinds of lessons and things that we do on Wednesday nights is to establish that foundation so you're getting exposed to the information. The reason we do stuff like this, so that whenever someone um, says something, right, that even if in the moment you're not like, oh, that is wrong because there's this and there's this and that, and you know, you're running through all the facts, you at least know, wait a minute, that's not right. I, I, I'm grounded in the truth, and there's something wrong going on there, and then at least you can go look closer. But I, I think a big part of the reason why a lot of this stuff seeps in is because people um, have, uh, well, no other way to really put it, but shallow faith, shallow knowledge about uh, doctrine and about what the Bible teaches. Um, and something comes along that sounds good because a lot of times these things are couched in a uh, very spiritual language new age especially is a problem because the spirituality and the language is involved um a, a lot of times and uh, you're talking about mormonism you know um same language different dictionary uh same thing goes on with new age there's a lot of the same words that they'll talk about with spirituality and salvation and redemption and things, but they mean totally different things. You're reading from different dictionaries. And so um, really the only way that we can, um, two things, two things that I think, I think we fail at spectacularly um, in the modern church is one, to be well grounded in biblical truth. And two, is to be in each other's business. That's something we fail at. So that whenever you're starting to kind of get, you know, that's starting to get its hooks in you, that I should actually have the freedom to go, um, what are you doing? You know that's not true, right? And just get in your business. We should be able to get in each other's business, right? We're supposed to hold each other accountable. There's 50-something commands we're given in the Bible that you can only do. You know, it says do this to one another, do this for one another. And we can only do that if we're a family, community, you know, kind of up in each other's business. Um, and, you know, that's the only way we can hold each other accountable. So whenever we start to fall into false doctrine, our brothers and sisters can come alongside and say, hold on, back up, let's re-examine this. And so. So I'm going to come at this from the perspective of uh, both uh, psychology and a theology of language because, and it's probably something that no one's going to get disagree on, language changes over time. Uh, so, for instance, if anyone, if you take out a 1611 version of the King James Bible, it talks about unicorns, right? 
well, we all know unicorns aren't real, so why does it say there's unicorns in the Bible? Well, it's because it was referring to a one-horned rhinoceros, right? One single, one corn, okay? Language changes. Uh, C.S. Lewis uses the example in A Mere Christianity about a gentleman. Gentleman used to mean that you were a landowner, right? Now we take it as being like a kind, nice male, right? So it, words change meaning. And so if we look at something like yoga, right, what is that really and what is that person referring to? And then trying to take it on the grounds of what does that person mean versus what baggage does this term carry along with it? And so if the person's talking about doing a stretching routine with a group of friends, probably not bad. But if they're talking about doing some stretching routine where they're praying to some foreign deities of some sort, even if they don't understand they're praying, probably not a good idea. Uh, and so being aware of that because so the psychological side of things, if we look at personality, there's typically recognized as five different traits. One of those is agreeableness, so how agreeable you are to other people. So a lot of people within the church are agreeable, so they're willing to accept, you know, your pastor says this or your friend says that, whatever, you accept that and say, okay, it's wrong. And now that becomes true for you because someone you trust says it. Well, other people aren't so agreeable, and so they're gonna say, well, what's wrong about it? I'm just stretching, right? So they're gonna have a different conception, and so you're gonna talk past each other because Again, it comes down to using words different. They're looking at what is this thing actually, not how am I using a specific term, whereas one person might be saying, well, no, my so-and-so said this thing with this term is wrong. And so you end up talking past each other without knowing it. So I'm going to tie that into, I think, a common, a, a big thing we see now within the church that's growing and is being huge is the Enneagram. It's this new age-ish kind of uh, personality test. And so a lot of people are going to denounce it and say, oh, that comes from New Age roots and it's bad. It's like, well, as a bunch of apologists up here, I think we're going to say, well, that's called the genetic fallacy. It doesn't matter where something came from, right? Because a, a broken clock can be right twice a day, right? So where something came, maybe it's possible that someone outside of Christianity stumbled on something about human nature that's true. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they have on that in many ways, and, and we shouldn't be afraid to affirm that. And so you have some people saying, well, don't use the Enneagram because it's new age and it's wrong and it's got occult backgrounds. And then the other people saying, well, psh, so what? It's effective. It taught me so much and it's great and it's helped me. And so then they talk past each other. Well, this is again, so where I'm going to come at it as a scientist who studies personality, I say, well, let's just put it up to the test. Does it accurately explain human personality? And so I'm going to test that and say, okay, well, look, no, it doesn't. It gets some people right, but it gets a lot of people wrong as well. And so it's not accurate, it's not reliable. So I'm not concerned about the roots, I'm concerned about the outcome, right? And so with the Enneagram, I'm say, well, the outcome is bad, it's not reliable, it doesn't accurately or truthfully tell you about a person, about yourself or about another person, although getting you to think more about who you are might be effective, but the tool itself is not. Whereas I'm going to look at, say, yoga or meditation and look at that. I don't care about the background. What's the effect? And if done in certain ways or done right without, without that baggage part of it, there may be good side effects for that. So having a, a daily stretching routine or maybe um, specifically a stretching routine with a group of friends might be really good for both your mental and your physical health. So I think we have to be careful to make sure we're drawing those distinctions between... Um, or really in how language is used and how a person is using a term versus how we might think they're using a term or how we use other people, how we think other people are using a term. Because again, a lot comes down to, to language. I guess if... I mean, maybe. So think of it maybe in a different situation. If um, a new age doctor developed Tylenol, would you use it? I'm, right. I'm thinking like most of us would say, oh, yeah, I mean, it works, right? Maybe he bases religion on it, right? And say, oh, this, I've created this new pain-killing drug, and this is a big thing for our religion. And we, well, so, but 
there's nothing necessarily wrong with that thing. It just happened to be because he has bad beliefs doesn't mean he developed something that's wrong or false or can't be used. So it comes down to that language, right? So you say, well, Tylenol, he's calling it his thing within an occultic kind of situation, a new age thing. He has different purposes from it. But in reality, it's this drug with a certain chemical compound that has a certain effect within our body. So I, I would tend to view yoga or um, all these different things as, as kind of as a medicine. And I would say, well, is it or is it not effective and for what? And regardless of where it came from. And, and I know there's a lot of disagreement. There's probably disagreement here on it. Um, and, and again, that's something where I'm going to say that that's okay. But what's important for me from a Christian perspective is are people thinking through it carefully? Mm -hmm. Because w again, we all have wrong beliefs. We're, every one of us, if you put us in a room and throw you know, the, the gamut of doctrine, so for my MDiv orals, we had to write like a 20 page paper on you know, doctrine of salvation, of creation, of humanity, so all these kind of nine major doctrines, right? If you did that with all of us here, we disagree on points, but what I would want to know and what they're testing us when we do those orals is are we thinking through them carefully and is our intent, what we're trying to do, is it to try to please God? Because that's, ideally we, we want our intent and our actions to both be right, but sometimes we're going to get the actions wrong and again having that humility to recognize that and always, always, always trying to do the right thing. Um, and then if and when we fail, to admit to that and fess up to it. And so that's one of those things where I'm going to say, yeah, maybe there's disagreement and we might counsel people a different way, but I, I'm going to come from that perspective of let, let's separate what the thing actually is versus what a specific person or group might claim that it is, if that makes sense. And I'll just, I'll say, just kind of adding on to that, I think there's a, a big difference between being aware and being fearful. Um, one of the things that I have to remind myself of all the time is uh, what Jesus told us. And he said, no matter what happens, the gates of hell will not overcome his church. I mean, it, it won't. Um, and, and if we believe that, and that's true, then anything that may infiltrate or creep in will ultimately die the death of a thousand qualifications because Jesus' church will not be defeated. It cannot be defeated. It will stand forever. Um, and, and so one of the things that I have to um, remind parents, I work with teenagers, so one of the things that I have to remind parents of teenagers is don't overreact. Like you, you, There are just moments when you just have to not overreact, and it's super hard. And, and there, are moments when, there are moments when overreaction probably is appropriate, but there are other moments when overreaction just makes something worse. And so the difference between being aware of what's going on and the difference between being fearful of what's going on are two different things, especially in regards to the church. Um, and so I think it is important for us to be aware of our culture, be aware of what's going on, be aware of what's being taught, be aware of these things, um, but also not to be fearful and go, oh my gosh, this is fixing to come in and crash. I had, I had literally... This is years ago. I had a parent, and if they're watching, so sorry, but um, I had a parent come to me and ask if they should take their child out of school for two days because they were teaching evolution and biology. I mean, sh should I remove my, should I extricate my child from, a, from a, her school so that she doesn't hear this information as a sophomore in high school? And my response was, well, do you not think she's already heard it or, or not going to hear it? Like, so the best thing that we can do as parents or just as human beings in general in the church as the body of believers is to shore ourselves up, which is the whole point of apologetics. Know what you believe and why you believe it. And I'm convinced that if you know those two things, there's nothing to fear. I mean, there's nothing new. I mean, we, we see this in, in the Bible. There's nothing new under the sun. We're not being taught anything new or groundbreaking that hadn't already been taught. And so we have to remind ourselves and preach to ourselves that Jesus has already overcome. We remind ourselves of John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world. And we believe that. We believe, yeah, he has won. He's already overcome. And nothing is going to defeat his church. And I think that, for me, is where I, I get so much more encouragement in knowing the culture and being aware of the culture, but not fearful of the culture. And I think that's where, where I would draw that distinction.
don't ask a question, we'll give the microphone back to Eric. And he'll just fill up the rest of the time. <laughs> Come on. An easy one. What is your favorite Bible verse? Favorite in what sense? Because there's some that are just like, like theologically speaking, you know, just like whatever uh, my favorite Bible verse would be. Um, oh, this is horrible because I'm trying, I always get mixed up. Is it Romans 8 5 or Romans 5 8? The, um, uh, God has demonstrated his love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, I mean, that, that right there, everybody loves John 3.16, and I'm like, no, um, Romans 5.8. Um, I, I think that one is just, that, um, just always come back to that. Um, overall favorite, just because um, I am a fundamentalist with extra emphasis on the fun, would have to be Mark chapter 14, verses 51 and 52. That's the naked guy in the garden where it says the guard, uh, there was a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment on him, and the guards tried to seize him, and he slipped out of his garment and ran off naked. Of all the sorts of things that are in the Bible, I'm like, that is amazing. Why is that in there? There was a streaker in the Garden of Gethsemane. Like, okay, whatever. You say that's an easy question, but it's probably really hard because it's like, again, how does one choose, right? Uh, so we, many. Like, criteria? I love, um, and I don't even remember which verse it is. It's uh, God gives grace to the humble but opposes the proud. It's in James. It's in Proverbs. Mm -hmm. And it's in um, Peter, is it? Or? Peter probably says it. I think. So it's in the Bible, like word for word, three different times. And I love that. I love that verse. It's a good reminder uh, for me and a, a way to do ministry and how to be. But I also mm -hmm. love um, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, which was one of the, well, it was the first Bible verse I memorized before I was even a Christian because I was tricked by my um, family to listen to Christian heavy metal as a kid. And so the, the name of the album was Weapons of Our Warfare. Uh, and so at the beginning is a person narrating and so the verse is, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, right? And so th that kind of set in, but then as I grew and developed, like that became like a verse that's really important to me. It's like, oh yeah, that's kind of what we do as apologists, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have weapons and they're not carnal, it's not flesh and blood, it's we we're using our mind to pull these down. And I probably stole the Eric's Bible verse <laughs> at the same time. But then the other one is an apologist, right? Uh, First Peter 3.15. And I'm going to give you, you know, the Jay Medinwalt perversion version, right? Yeah, so then we won't have any questions. Yeah, yeah so uh, just, pull them just all, take right? them all. Yeah. You know, always be prepared to give an apologetic. So the Greek, that <laughs> apologia, that's, that would be probably what I would say the best translation. Not a de most versions say defense. And so, again, it's not that easy of a question. <laughs> but easy in the sense of no pressure, right? Because you can't get it wrong. wrong. You can talk about a naked guy like Mark, and it's not a wrong <laughs> answer. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I, I celebrate the entire catalog of Leviticus and um, just really love the 613 laws there. No, um, John 16:33 certainly is one of them, one that I, that I just uh, used a while ago. Um, Hebrews 12, 1 and 3 are also another set. But the one that I think most recently has just resonated with me, and I'm not sure why, um, but just it's, for me it's reminding me of just how great God is. Um, is Psalm 73, 25, and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but you are my strength and my portion forever. To me, this in, in recent, um, recent weeks, that, that particular passage has just meant more to me than, than I could have ever dreamed it would have. And I don't really have a... There's not, nothing traumatic's happened. There's nothing crazy that's going on. But just that reminder... Um, it really, if everything I loved and everything I owned and everything that I valued and everything that I cared about was stripped away and I still had Jesus, it causes me to ask the question, would that be enough? You know, and I would love to sit here and go, well, yeah, of course it would be, but I don't know. And it's a crisis sometimes that I have to come to and go, would, it, would he be enough for me? And so that verse reminds me that even in those moments, when crisis does come and when Pain does come, and when heartache does come, and when loss comes, I didn't have anything really to begin with other than God anyway. And so just rem that reminder to trust in him because he is my strength. He is my portion, not my own. 
my own strength, my own doing, or anything like that. So I, I've really loved that verse as of late, just to, that reminder of, of God's sovereignty um, and, and just my, my dependency on him. Um, I was actually kind of thinking of going the route that Mark had went because uh, when I, I took my kids uh, at Halloween, we went to some churches, and then one lady uh, told my kids, uh, give me a verse and I'll tell you some candy. And I was really tempted to tell my daughter, say this verse, like a really inappropriate verse. Because uh, there's a lot of surprisingly interesting, I would say, you, you would, you'd blush. Rated you, R. Yeah, rated R verses in scripture. But it's, it's also something I appreciate about scripture, about how, how unedited it is, where it's like just open exposure and transparency. Anything from... I won't say that one, which is which is funny because I'm thinking no, like I'm not going to say a Bible verse in church. Let's not do that. But no, I'm not. <laughs> Ask me later. Um, <clears throat> but then there's also like there's there's a verse where God's talking to His people and He says you're playing the harlot, which is basically you saying you're being a whore, and I you're not faithful to me. In fact, you lift your skirt to everyone who walks by, and it's just like whoa, what did I pick up the right book for the shades of Jesus or something like what you know it's. It's, it's, it's a very provocative song of Solomon. There's a lot of, sorry, my ADHD medicine's wearing off, so my filter's kind of wearing off, too. Um, but, but, uh, but what's funny, too, is that you have people who even take verses so out of context, it's almost embarrassing. There was a, a gift card one time in, in a Hallmark store. Not a gift card, uh, cards. I think it was during Christmas. And it says something like, and everyone like left their house and gave gifts to each other. You think, oh, that's a sweet, nice verse to put on a Hallmark card. But when you look at the context of the verse, it has to do with the thing in Revelations where they killed the two prophets. And because they killed the two prophets who were preaching the gospel, everybody got so excited and started handing gifts to each other. So to put that on a card for Christmas, it's like, wow. There, uh, I heard a story once <clears throat> of... Um, this lady, she uh, she sent flowers to uh, to somebody for, for, I think her niece had got married or something like that. And she sent her flowers and she wrote like a, a verse like John, I don't remember exactly what, let's say it's 5-4. She meant, again, I made up which one it was, but let's say it was John 4-5, not 5-4. Because the one she meant, let's say the one she meant was, let's say 5-4, it says something like, um, something about being happy and whatever. Um, but the, the reverse, John 4-5 said... He's not your husband, and the guy who you're living with is currently not your husband either, and you have had five husbands before him. So it was one of those things to where, you know, uh, uh, I agree with what Jay was saying. It's kind of hard in the sense that it, I guess it depends on what, what it is that, I, that I'm going through or dealing with, kind of like kind of like utensils. Which utensil is your favorite? Well, it depends what I'm eating. If I'm eating cereal, I prefer a spoon. If I'm eating this, I prefer a fork, a knife, whatnot. Um, different seasons to use the christian language different seasons of my life sometimes i turn to different books of the bible I'll look for different things but overall like with apologetics i'm definitely with what jay was saying second corinthians 10 4 and 5 i'm i'm on board with that because that, that for me is we're talking about what spiritual warfare is and i often argue in fact and one of the things i referred to earlier i say if you want to be effective in evangelism and spiritual warfare then biblically speaking you can't do it without apologetics and I tell people, if you don't like that, take it up with the author. I just read the book. I didn't write it. You know, uh, it, It's what Scripture tells us to do. But one of the verses that I've liked overall, even before I was really getting into ministry, the verse that says, I would have lost heart unless uh, I had believed that I would see the Lord in the land of the living. What I, what I like there is, while he's definitely giving credit to the Lord, doing, it, doing everything. This is David talking. I think it was in, um, in Psalms. He's also saying, but I had to believe it for myself. I couldn't depend on someone else to believe that for me. I couldn't depend on someone else to have that faith for me. I had to believe it for myself that I would see this. And if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here. And it, it was always a constant reminder to me that whether or not my friends wanted to follow Christ in youth group, whether or not, you know, when I got older, my friends believed that God had called me to ministry or not. And whether or not that was relevant, whether or not that was there, that was irrelevant to the fact that I still had to do what God called me to do, even if no one else did. Whether it was my, my closest friends or my family or whatever the case was, I have to know and believe that this is what God has called me to. Not by blind faith, obviously, but in, in, in context, they're basically saying this is something that I have to do for myself that no one else can do for me. And if I can do that and stay faithful to what God's called me to, then I too will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, as David said.
Last question. Um, this is kind of uh, personal. This is kind of raw. Um, I've had personal, intimate relations uh, experiences with Christ. Can y'all share an intimate relation or an intimate uh, encounter with Christ that really changed your lives? Uh, yeah, I think um, the one that most recently comes to mind, uh, there was uh, six years ago, uh, my brother-in-law uh, took his own life. And um, one of the most painful and traumatic, clearly, moments that, that I've ever had to walk through, and of course my wife being her brother, she's walked through that. Um, but I can say, for me, and I think I, I could speak for my wife on this, the way that Jesus manifested himself in those moments, um, in that year, in those months, in those days, was unmistakable. And, and what I mean by that is this, um, it would have been easy, really easy to kind of go, why God? Why did you do this? I'm angry. Um, and, just, and certainly to some degree, there was some of that. Um, but Jesus um, was so present and so real that we were able to look at the situation and we were able to go, even in this pain, even in this hurt, even in this heartache, we still have hope and we still have joy. And I don't, I, I just, well, I can say with assurance, that doesn't come from anywhere else. Um, in the bleakest moment of life, when everything goes away, Jesus stands firm and he stands in the gap. And he comforted us and the Holy Spirit comforted us in ways that literally nothing else would have worked. And so that intimate relationship that we had then has only grown because what we've seen is Jesus made promises in his Bible, right? Like in his, in his own words, he made promises that we see in the New Testament. And what I have to remind myself in these moments is his promises are reliable. Um, they will come true. They are real. They're not empty. Um, and when he says things like, cast my burden upon, um, cast your burden upon me for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. When he says these kinds of things, that's not a, a suggestion. It's not an idea. It's a promise. And when we did that, when we said, Lord, we don't understand. We don't get it. I don't know why this happened. I don't understand why you allowed these things to happen. But we love you. And you're still king. And you're still on your throne. Whatever you need to do, you do it. When we did that, and it was hard. When we did that, that promise was absolutely true. Uh, we didn't have to shoulder the burden of why. We were able to rest in the assurance of his promises. And so for me, that's one of the most intimate moments in that whole year, really, that I've ever experienced um, in walking with Jesus was just to, even in the midst of grief and anger and loss and everything else, to say, we trust in your promise. And he absolutely, without fail, came through and delivered. And, and to say that it's not hard sometimes still would be a lie. But his promise is still true today. And we rest in that and we rely on that. And that's been, for me, one of those moments where I can, <laughs> I can clearly point to and say, if not for Jesus, I don't know. Um, uh, th there, I mean, there's a lot of different times, and I don't, I don't know these guys' views on the continuation versus cessationist view. I'm a continuationist, um, but I mean, I, I've had uh, yes, no. I don't know what the church is. Yes, okay, good. Yeah, so whatever y'all say it doesn't matter. No, I'm just joking. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I, I've just th there's times where um, I think of the day that I kind of rededicated my life to Christ, and the, and the night before, where uh, I, in my mind there's there's a lot to it, but basically just the Lord got a hold of me and, and spoke to me, and even I, I just. Keep it brief where it spoke to me, but there's someone else where there was specific things I was struggling and wrestling with. And 
I remember thinking, well, no, I need this and that, and then having someone come and confirm that with me, and that very next day, <coughs> and just really kind of, kind of just having that, that a conversation with God, and, and then I remember it was at a small church where there was like maybe four or five people that had showed up, and they were mostly um, like older ladies, and, and I thought like, God, I want to be here, my mom drugged me here, and then... Um, I remember after kind of just that, that first part of the service and just kind of really like, okay, God, I think I, I, I want to give it all to you. I remember the lady who was leading worship was one of the oldest ladies there at the church, and they basically just played a, a, a cassette tape. Uh, those of you who are younger don't know what that is, but it's a, a, just, it's a square thing you put in and push play. And then she was just singing to the cassette tape, and it was very off-key, not even on beat with the cassette. But I just remember for the first time in a long time truly worshiping God irrelevant to how bad it sounded and everything like that but just kind of giving it just really singing and, and glorifying God because a concern that I have these days is that some some of the worship music that's out there is not really worship music just because you sing about God and add an element like water or fire or something like that and you know uh, <coughs> so I, I, I think it's Coco who said a lot of times what's past is praise and worship music isn't really because praise and worship isn't is supposed to be to God and about God and a lot of times it's more about us than God. If you hear the word I or me too many times in a worship song, it's like, who am I singing to or what am I singing about? And sometimes it's more of we're celebrating how we feel as opposed to adoring and praising God. And sometimes it gets confused. Nevertheless, I say that to say when I'm able to just really express myself to God and when I see God's hand in all of the stuff in the past that he's done, I can go through testimony after testimony, but there's times like when, I got, when we got our first house that people said, you know, you're, you don't have enough money to get something a nice house or whatever when we first got it i just for at least 30 minutes just while everyone was asleep in the house with tears in my eyes just walking back and forth to the house like god you knew all along you were faithful and and even when i doubted even when when we weren't sure how we we're gonna do it you pulled through and and even the times where i could have given up and you know even having it causing friction within my own marriage and stuff like that and, and times where i'd pray and i felt like god was silent and why aren't you saying anything and, and what's going on here but then at the end of the day, looking back and seeing all those breadcrumbs that he left. And then I think in those kind of moments when you can, you're can, you at the end of that part of the journey and you look back and you just can't help but get filled with tears and thinking, wow, you really had it planned all along even though I, didn't, I, even though I doubted, even though I didn't know how you were going to do it. Looking at those kind of moments like that for me are one of the, some of the best moments I've had in that kind of intimacy and just increases my trust and faith in God. My experience has been um, a little less obvious with God, might be the best way to say it. Uh, so there's never been really a time in my life where it's been like, oh, wow, God is like present in such an amazing way. And I've prayed for that and sought after that, uh, but that just hasn't been the way he's worked with me. There's been maybe a couple times where I felt like there was another presence kind of with me in prayer but typically in my experience it's been more of seeing doors open and shut uh, things that don't necessarily make sense and and through reading the word and seeing things that i've read a hundred times in a different <coughs> way and you know then like oh wow am i making up some new heresy and then you know um going to my going to my commentaries and reading and like oh wow how did i miss this before when they all these scholars talk about this and it's such an amazing thing or uh, in ways that like that and so uh, and i've struggled with that in some ways to say like well is is that indi indicative of where my salvation might be and um, through hearing others talk about it and studying it, I really think it's, you know, we have different experiences, we have different stories, we, we've come to faith different ways, we have different walks, and none of that is what our salvation is. Mm -hmm. Our salvation is in who we come put on. our trust in. Um, and so knowing that sometimes when we hear certain stories and same iterations or similar iterations over and over again, for those who have maybe a different story, sometimes it can be discouraging. And so I, I kind of wonder sometimes if maybe that's why God has given me that experience and why he speaks to me in the way that he does and in that um, just very simple and not so obvious way is for those who he also gives that experience to for encouragement and unity and just to keep that in mind that you know, God isn't forced to do things the same way for everyone. I mean, look at the Gospels and how Jesus healed people. He doesn't heal people the same way 
twice, right? He rubs spit and so soil in some people's eyes and he just tells people to stand up and walk. And so he's got these different methods and different ways uh, which glorify God ultimately. I think he does that through the different ways he interacts with us. And certainly there's going to be some overlap, but we shouldn't necessarily expect that we're always going to have the same experiences. Um, and I'll definitely second that. That's one thing that, you know, we know about people. We relate to different people in different ways because they have different personalities, right? What is a famous book, The Love Languages, right? You love someone the way they receive it, not the way you want, you know? It's like, you know, guys, you don't buy your wives, you know, certain things for their, you know, for anniversary or birthdays. Just because you like it doesn't mean that's what they want. In the same way God relates to each of us, the way that we're going to, you know, uh, accept and receive that intimacy. Um, what's interesting is there seems to be a common thread um, that runs through the, the intimate moments with Christ that really jumps out at um, in, in most people. And it usually seems to be a moment of pain, a moment of grief, some kind of moment of struggle where um, we're going through something, and, and but it's Christ coming alongside us. In, in my particular instance, First thing that came to mind when you asked, years ago, um, I was um, intending to um, uh, marry uh, a woman I was dating. We'd been dating for over a year, and this was the one, um, you know, spoiler alert, she wasn't. Um, I, I, I had a ring being custom crafted by the jeweler. Um, her best friends were plotting with me on how to um, orchestrate the perfect moment to pop the question. And one night after a date, she just laid it on me that we're done. At floor, every, you know, like I said, her best friends didn't see it coming. They were actually on my side. Um, at the time, I was working at a church, and it you know it was late at night, and I'd driving around angry, and ended up at this you know church I was working at, and I went in, and you know about one o'clock in the morning, I marched straight down the middle aisle of the sanctuary, looked right up at the stained glass Jesus looking down at me, and I shook my fist at him, and I let him have it. How dare you! introduce such a wonderful person into my life. There's just everything I thought I could want is right there in front of me. And you're, and, and I, I mean, I, I just unleashed all of my frustration and anger. And that moment, there may have even been profanity involved. I don't remember. And I love the songs that talk about the gentleness and sweetness of God's caress. Um, that's not what I felt in that moment. I had a Job 38 moment where I couldn't, you know, there was no audible voice, but the spiritual sense that just overwhelmed me was definitely a who do you think you are realization. And all, and I don't remember the trip, and I'm not trying to be dramatic there. I really don't remember. I went from this position to on my face, weeping and sobbing on the floor because who did I think I was? And then moments later, that's when the gentleness and the peace and the love came in. And so my heavenly father had to break me down to where I would be willing to allow him to take me into his embrace and comfort me and everything. And that was just such an overwhelming um, experience of intimacy. And, you know, th th there have been all kinds of little things that have gone on. But, but I think that that sort of thing... And, and I think that you'll find if you ask this question to a lot of people, most of them are going to answer with some kind of, I was in hardship and Jesus was there for me. I was in grief and Jesus was there for me. And, right? and, and, and sometimes it may not even be just that, you know, he came alongside and gentle and strengthened. Some of us have to, you know, need the spiritual two by four upside the head for him to get our attention before we'll even quit talking long enough to listen to let him come along and comfort us. And um, so, yeah, that, that was, and, and, and you see all these different experiences, all these different personalities, the situations are different, the things we're in, the, what we needed from Christ in that moment was different, and he knew each one of us and gave us what we needed. And I think that's an a, important thing to take away from that. So, okay, we are over time. That was a good one to end on, thank you, but we are done. 
our, our time has come to an end, and um, I don't know that anyone here can sing good enough for us to sing you out and goodbye, but um, let me close us in prayer, and then um, we'll have an enjoyment to the rest of our evening. Father God, we thank you. We thank